So I guess I'm going to amplify um, a piece of the joys and concerns. Terry Chin actually was with her husband, and this is just my brief um, rendition of what happened to her. They were walking, and the dog decided to zig, and they decided to zag. And um, she broke both of her wrist and her kneecap. And you might not have heard her but she was laughing. Diane Morgan had an accident, a car accident, about a week ago, um, and she's on one of those little scooters. Diane Morgan makes the food to bring to Terry Chen. <laughs> so if you're new to the congregation, this is the kind of congregation um, that you're participating um, with today, and they're just... Um, continue to show amazing um, sides of themselves and each other. So I'm going to invite you into a time of quiet. And this is kind of an Advent meditation. I want you to think about in the next three weeks what the Buddhist would refer to as setting an intention for how you are going to show up at your holiday gatherings and your cooking and your running around and your clerks that are helping you that are those of you that are brave enough to still real shop and not just go to Amazon. But what kind of intention are you going to set for yourself? So I'd like you to close your eyes and think of how you can adjust some of the anxieties and stresses you might have already been feeling from this emotionally packed time. And think about how you would like to show up. What is your mindful intention of being? And where your hopefulness rests in our shared silence. Oh, what a joy and a blessing it is to be fully human, to come up with these thoughts in the silence and think of a word or a phrase. And when you're ready, please open your eyes. And then maybe write that phrase or that thought or that word on a snowflake that'll be over by our tree and there will be some blue tape, or if you don't have time to tape it, you can write your intention. If you want to put your name on it, that's great. And you will see how it crystallizes as the weather changes. So that activity will be waiting for you after service. Unitarian Universalist ministers are so lucky and then so burdened. I remember when I was in seminary at the United Church of Christ Seminary, which we finally said they were Unitarians considering Christ, UCC, and they were fine with that kind of little joke. But other Christian ministers have a liturgical calendar that I follow. And so they, every um, Sunday, there's a specific scripture reading that they refer to, and then, then that is the core of what their message is about. Unitarian Universalists don't have such a core. Our core is wider and broader. And one wise, wise person at a dinner party once said, well, how do you figure out what to talk about? I'm not sure, and I'm not sure why I decided that today I should highlight Noam Chomsky Day for you, because it's quite a challenge. Noam Chomsky is quite a guy. 
But I know, I'm not sure who, but I know there are a couple people here, and there are a couple people that live all the way in Troy that wanted to be here because it's Noam Chomsky Day. The reading, one of um, Noam Chomsky's quotes I would like to start with, responsibility, I believe, accrues with through privilege. People like you and me have an unbelievable amount of privilege, and therefore, we have a huge amount of responsibility. We live in free societies where we are not, we're not afraid of the police. We have extraordinary wealth available to us by global standards. If you have those things, then you have the kind of responsibility that a person does not have if he or she is slaving 70 hours a week to put food on the table. A responsibility at the very least to inform yourself about power. Beyond that, it's a question of whether you believe in moral certainties or not. And then to make sure that you remain optimistic, he says, optimism is a strategy for making a better future because unless you believe that the future can be better, you are unlikely unlikely to step up and take responsibility for making it so. Mr. Murphy, would you retrieve me a glass of water? Unitarian Universalists, in my opinion, they're both fortunate and challenged by the openness of our beliefs and our exploration. The word worship, for example, means to bind together and to bring together ideas and actions of, that you find worthy. And so uh, a lot of times Unitarian Universalists have knee-jerk reactions. They don't want to use the word religion. They don't want to use the word um, prayer. They don't want to use the word worship. We need our God. So we need not to throw those words out with the bathwater, um, but to look at where those words derived and reclaim them. And thank you very much. It's not vodka. <clears throat> so today, we're taking some of the words from and thoughts and ideas from Avron Noam Chomsky, a Sagittarian, right? Born December 7th, 1928, and he is definitely still alive. He was born in Philadelphia to Russian parents who were Hebrew scholars and teachers. He encourages all of us to break out of the control and domination of social media that drives us into self-reinforcing bubbles and should be resisted by having an intellectual defense. There's gonna be a lot of sentences like that. We don't have time to break them down. This isn't a six-week course on Noam Chomsky. It's a 17-and-a-half-minute message on Noam Chomsky. He stated that to be truly educated and to be fulfilled as a human, we must use our ability to create independent thinking through studying all the resources available to us and then do what all Unitarian Universalists are good at, question, 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 and challenge what is presented to you. The educational systems should cultivate this ability of where to look for information, not just a repetition of facts and teaching for the test. For those of you that are educators, that's a big statement, and we have a big problem in the United States that the rest of the world is acknowledging and seeing, and we have to catch up. Today's message hopefully will engage your curiosity to do just that, to listen, question, and challenge. Don't challenge me, I'm not Noam Chomsky. Challenge his ideas with your own ideas and resources and research. Although some describe him as a public intellectual, he sees himself as an American professor known for his work in linguistics, political activism, and social criticism. He is very specific about his use of words. Maybe we should claim him as a Unitarian. And reminds us that to be a public intellectual 
holds up a privilege of our position in society. For example, a homeless person could have amazing ideas and a strong and deep intellect, but does not have the context to share those ideas? Or would the media use their power to advance those ideas? So he rejects that description as a public intellectual. Another lofty description used by Professor Shomsky is the father of modern linguistics. Wow, that's a lot to bear. And so some of you have heard me get excited in the last few weeks about this academic genealogy tree. Some of you that have doctorates are like, oh, poo poo, everybody has one in academia. Well, I didn't get a PhD, so I never saw one. But your name is there, and then whoever impacted you intellectually or your mentors are connected. And so the one that I saw was this man's name that was a scientist, um, and he was connected to the ideas of Isaac Newton. I made a joke that mine would connect me to the ideas of Martha Stewart, but <clears throat> this with Noam Chomsky, he had this idea that put him on the map. It was universal grammar, and he postulated that children worldwide are born with basic innate grammatical skills, a naturalistic approach that supports that there's a structure in the human brain that is actually hardwired for grammar. Transformational gener generative grammar. Transformational gener see, it's those R's. It's always the R's. Generative grammar relates to this brain's hardwiring. So learning sounds. Words, sentences begin this innate ability, and all languages have a noun, verb, adjective, and some grammatical structure. This might not seem like a big deal to some of you, but this theory went up against the theories that we are born with a clean slate, and it is through mimicking what we hear that we have this learned language. It's all probably somewhere in the in-between. Noam Chomsky's theory, however, of the brain being hardwired is still up for scientific and academic debate. Some <clears throat> believe in B.F. Skinner's approach that a person is first exposed to a stimulus which elicits a response, and then the stimulus, um, the, the response is then reinforced. And so that might be a counter idea, and the debate continues. He received a doctorate in 1955 for this work. He's a major figure in analytical philosophy and one of the founders in the field of cognitive science. He is still teaching at University of Arizona, and he's an institute professor emeritus from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which all of you know is MIT. Among the most cited authors, he has written more than 150 books on war, politics, ideology, and he aligns himself. Mary Lou and I have been practicing this. Anacro syndication. Thank you, Mary Lou. Or syndication, if you don't want to pronounce the other word. It's a political philosophy, it's an anarchist school of thought that views revolutionary industry unionism as a method for workers that still are in a capitalist society to gain control of an economy and thus control influence in the broader society. These are the base ideas where all co-ops come from. And so that you don't have to own everything. This is going to have to be a two-parter, or I hope you packed your lunch. OK, we will zoom ahead to libertarian socialism. It's a movement which emphasizes self-governance and self-management of workers, anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist political current. It's contrasted with other forms of socialism 
but it dates all the way back to the 17th and 18th hundreds in libertarian socialism to the Age of Enlightenment. These are not new ideas. They are ideas that need to be brought forward and applied or at least rethought about and discussed. Most of us don't have that kind of time anymore because it relates right back to the thread that we are spending so much time on social media that we have fewer hours in our day. Anyway, the plot thickens. The struggle that ran in Ch runs in Chomsky's blood uh, has an emancipation story that goes all the way back to being an Ashkenazi Jew. It constituted a move from one place to the other as the Jewish um, uh, people moved into places as they were tossed out and the wars between the Holy Empire and them continued. They spoke Yiddish. In Eastern Europe, they took on many of the cultural uh, rituals of the European people. And his parents developed this interest with him in a kind of an, an, uh, an anarchy, if you will, as he read through as many books as he could get his hands on. But he saw that he sees this as a point of justice. So he pulls back this curtain, this curtain that many of us have fallen into, the, to look at things in a simple, simple way. Nothing is simple. And when you come down to sound bites, and usually the conversations we have, sorry, even at coffee hour or at our parties or with our family, sometimes we don't want to go deeper. It takes a lot of time, and he always encourages you to take the time. Some of you remember liberation theology. It was one of the theologies that was alive and well in the 1980s, and we studied it in seminary. The Bible wasn't just used for love and contentment and compassion and empathy. It was used as a powerhouse base for justice. And so sometimes it was used as a defense to go to war or to have violence to break down the powers that be so that there could be room for everyone, including the poor. I thought that this was very um, interesting. Chomsky explains that when six leading Jesuit intellectual elites were murdered in the, 19, in the 1980s, that the US was behind a lot of that in a rise to stop liberation theology which empowered the poor. Back in 1962, some of us were around for that. Pope John the 23rd, uh, Vatican II, Vatican II, the priest turned around. We could see what he was doing. They spoke in English. My parents were having fits at the dinner table because it was all supposed to be a mystery. But also what was happening is Pope John 23rd attempted to revive the Gospels with giving options to the poor to using the Gospels on their own behalf. The U.S. national bishops responded radically against liberation theology as it countered the church's previous description of a church for the rich and the powerful. At the same time, the church wanted to uphold their power for the rich, now has its struggles of giving in to what we have now as a Pope, Pope Francis, who is very progressive and he has welcomed everyone. And he means everyone, just like us, the LBGTQ people, including there's been a firing of a bishop in Texas who went against the Pope's liberal inclusions. The times and the systems sometimes do change, but it takes a long time. So I'm not going to go in to the Nixon years. Why would we have to revisit that? But you might want to in your own um, research. In a recent interview, Shamsky was asked what the measure of dangerous times included. He said first, here he is with hair down to here looking like Einstein in his 90s. How the doomsday clock has been accelerated 
to 90 seconds before midnight over the past few years is due to nuclear acceleration and an irreversible tipping point of fossil fuel production in the US with increased public support and what he gently describes as the Trump years. And although China is starting to reach its goals of net zero fossil fuels earlier than ever projected, the tipping point in the US is a negative counterbalance because we keep increasing. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is also another measure of the dangerous times with over 500,000 civilians killed and it's a war crime and it keeps going. He also relates us back to Reagan, back to the crimes in El Salvador in the 80s, another war crime, 80,000 dead, the US strongly involved. Are we imperialist? That's up to your discussion later. The US backed invasion of Lebanon and how this is the one that meets the um, different mindsets that we have here. We have people that think linearly and think people that think emotionally and this hits both of us. And how now commemorating atrocities of war with Iraq by naming a warship the USS Fallujah a city that we went in to destroy, and now we are commemorating that destruction by naming a USS warship. So one of the points that comes when listening to Shamsky or by going deeper into these historical thinkers, not just him, into any geo geopolitical issue is that the complexity to understanding how extremists in any part of the world can gain popularity. Noam Chomsky explains again what many of you are aware of. For example, how the popularity of a demagogue, this is a quote from Noam Chomsky, not me, demagogues such as Donald Trump gains popularity started at least back into the 1980s and actually even further back, but when Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher worked closely in a class war that destroyed labor unions. The transfer of wealth shifted, leaving the top 1% with 90% of the wealth. And so at least for the past 40 years, the working class, some of us, population grows angry and despondent and non-trusting, making them easy prey to promises of a demagogue, whoever it is in whatever part of the world it happens. And so I will close with this idea. Because this is an ongoing idea. Oh boy, this makes me want to be a part-time teacher someplace. They give me more than 17 and a half minutes. Anyway, I encourage you to watch commercials, as you will, and listen to them. I don't mean to go out and buy a TV for those of you Unitarian Universalists that have evolved and you have no TV at all. I'm not saying to go one, but if you watch a commercial, look at how the propaganda model of media criticism, which Noam Chomsky teaches about a lot, is alive and well. Don't you love it when those two women with the sparkly dresses walk, they do this walk, I won't do it, boy am I tempted to do it, but I'm not a model, it's that model walk where you wear high heels and you kind of stomp and they tell all of you that it's so easy to gamble right from your own house and you can have enough money to pay for all your Christmas presents. It's so wonderful. I'm addicted to the walk. I'm going to get it down and one day you're going to see it. Or how about the media that shows that you can eat all this fast food, have sugar in your coffee at all the different places. And not worry, because soon you'll have diabetes and heart problems, but you'll be on a beach and you'll be taking these other pills that will get rid of all that you saw on the media. 
So the medical machine is alive and well with the media, and it all works, and we buy into it for the same reason that we turn on the news and think we can encapsulate all these ideas in three minutes. Every generation, and I didn't expect to say this, but I'm going to say this. This is Leonetta's opinion, not Noam Chomsky. I'll call him later and see if he agrees. But every generation gets a little, little more lenient in how we raise our children and what we expect of them in social um, situations and in learning situations. And if you look back at what many of our parents, I don't care how old you are, our parents went through to buy their first house or to start their business if they were that fortunate or how many unions and how many layoffs and how close I got to my dad because every year he was laid off and I got to go to the unemployment office with him on Monday before visiting my Italian grandparents. It made us closer, but I don't think that that's the point. The point is how do we encourage our children and our youth and how do we reintroduce ourselves to take the time to go deeper? And in closing, Noam Chomsky's words, keep away from cliches. The world is much more complicated. So this is the kind of service that we will never have a talk back. I raised two teenagers. I don't want to be talked back anymore, but we could have a dialogue and we don't have time, but you all have all of coffee hour and you have the upcoming conversations in the holidays. Be careful. If you bring up this man's name, it won't come across like you're talking about gnomes. So be it.